so, oh dear God, wading into the, the pretendian um, conversation. This was a super divisive one of 2021. Yeah, mostly on social media. I think the kind of the way that people talk about things on Twitter does not reflect reality. Um, so I'd encourage people who spend too much time on Twitter to like just go talk to some people in person because, I don't know, shit's different <laughs> in the real world. Um, but the, you know, Jacqueline Keeler, right, compiled this list. I don't, I haven't seen the list lately. I have stopped kind of tracking this sometime in the spring. Um, it was like super controversial. Like people were doxing, like people were like trashing her children. Um, people were just really pissed off and disgusted by even the term pretendian really rubs people the wrong way. Um, and there were a lot of people, like a lot of really well-known, very beloved people on that list that she created. Um, and so, you know, it was crazy. And she did say, I think, uh, that the one profession or the one industry in which pretendianism is the most rife um, and pretty much just out of control is the academy. And that is very true. Um, there are still people I know who are very prominent figures in indigenous studies who are questionably indigenous and probably, probably like pretty sure that they're white and um, that they're ethnic frauds. And these are people with like fancy positions who have like um, award-winning books and things like that. And so, um, what she did though, is she actually like took the whisper network. So this is the thing. So let's say, let's talk about gender and sexual violence, right? Against native women. Like there's has been, there are long existing whisper networks about how do you support, you know, native women who are trying to exit abusive relationships? How do you not out like a powerful native man who is an abuser? I mean, me too kind of changed that. You know, Me Too is just like, it changed. Like, we don't have to whisper anymore. I think about these people, these perps in our communities and however people might feel about Jacqueline Keeler's list um, and kind of like the witch hunt that it created, which I, I also find, you know, like morally and ethically questionable. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people had issues with. You know, Jacqueline Keeler was kind of operating in a spirit of like outing, like preds. Because people who claim to be indigenous who aren't, almost all of whom are white, like that's predatory, period. That's like peak settler colonialism. Like when a white person is playing Indian to the extent, you know, that they're gaining remarkable social and financial and cultural capital off of that. And this is, there's like a, it's a problem. It's a real fucking problem. And it needed, it needed to be more out in the open, quite frankly, because mostly we all just whisper about it and we tiptoe around it. And we are friends with these people. We, these are people we've had in our homes. These are people we've been in ceremonies with and those kinds of things. And then to find out that those people are lying, you know, is not only an incredible betrayal, but it's also just like deeply disgusting. And I don't know, man, it's the end of 2021. Like that shit just shouldn't fly anymore. Like, like people, especially white settlers lying about being indigenous, that's just unacceptable. Like you just shouldn't be allowed to do that anymore. And so I think this is there's a, like a whole other kind of theme to our review of 2021 that has to do with like racism and the politics of representation of indigeneity in the public realm, um, identity, you know, questions around identity and like the visibility actually of native people, of native women, of native issues that I think like the discourse around pretendianism was part of all of this stuff that was being whipped up. And really, I think a consequence of like the cultural revolution of the last year um, in the United States around representation, particularly I think of like indigenous, indigenous trans and black folks, I think have had way more visibility in the public realm um, as a result of some of these shifts that have happened, um, particularly I think after the uprising of the summer of 2020, and so I think that this discourse, that's part of the reason why this hit in a particular way and gained a lot of traction um, in Indian country around pretendianism. It's, it is because like at a time when Native people are more visible in the public realm, we have to deal with the fact that a lot of people, a lot of quote unquote Native people who are visible in the public realm are in fact not Native. They're just fucking liars. <laughs> like, why can't we just say that? Why does it have to be so complicated? And that those people are not, 
They're like enemies of indigenous liberation. Like who would lie about that? Only someone who knew that they could gain power and recognition within like a, an economy of representation that is on the rise would do something like that. Yep. And it's, and that's, that's not a good person. And that's what it's all about. It's all about gaining stature, some sort of status um, and money. It's all about it being able to commodify uh, this false identity and sell it to whatever organization you're trying to sell it to. So it's just, it's just the epitome of settler um, behavior to commodify culture and and then Im- try to embody it and sell yourself as as an indigenous person for academic um, gain or whatever gain you want and it's been going on for a long time I mean yep. it, back in in my day at at UNM um, it was Ward Churchill and uh, you know, Ward Churchill came to speak at UNM, and it would have to be UNM, where because of the the high number of actual indigenous people and students there, that someone said, you know, why do you have this guy here? He's not actually native, and I mean this has been this this has been going on for a long time, but but with as as Melanie was saying, with the 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 um, uptick in actual representation in the media. Um, these people need to be called out and they need to, to, I mean, it, it needs to be unacceptable. It needs to be yeah, made. It really does. Yeah, it needs to be made. There needs to be some sort of um, real effort to be made to make the, um, to make it so unacceptable that people won't try to keep doing it. Yep. There need to be consequences. And by and large, even in the academy, like well-known ethnic frauds uh, have not been fired. You know, they still have jobs. They're still getting publishing contracts. You know, they still get speaking gigs and the like. And so um, I feel like Jacqueline Keeler's list was like a first, I I think fumbled, you know, and uh, not careful. But nevertheless, a first attempt at accountability, like in the public sphere, you know, we live, we live in an age of neoliberal multiculturalism, which is essentially where identities and minoritized identities have capital and they can give you remarkable mobile mobility, um, financially and socially on social media or in jobs. Um, you know, a report came out that like the number one, um, racial, racial or ethnic category that white students marked on college admissions applications that they lied about was American Indian, Alaskan native, because they know, right. There's, we're in, we're in a particular moment of neoliberal multiculturalism where indigeneity is considered a form of capital that can give you mobility through spaces, um, and access to certain resources. And so identity is attached to resources and everyone knows this. (laughs) And so, um, I mean, there's a lot to be said to unpack that because there's a lot of ickiness, I think, involved in that. Um, but like a huge chunk of that is this pretendian problem that has really, I mean, you know, Phil Deloria 25 years ago was writing about how playing Indian is like a centerpiece of settler identity. I mean, it's really foundational um, to se- white settler identity, particularly in white supremacy in the United States specifically. And so um, I had, I, I've now had to have a whole ass conversations in my classes about these individuals because they're still, the, actually, cause I do a lot of work in indigenous feminist and queer studies. There's a, a large number of these individuals who are indigenous feminist and queer studies, actually, um, ethnic frauds. It's a thing. Um, and so I always have to talk about the politics of citation um, often having identity or conversations about identity and how to handle, how to handle these people ethically, right? How to cite, how to cite them or not to cite them and those kinds of things. And so it's been a whole learning curve for me too, as a professor, um, to learn how to, to do it in a way that is honest and ethical, but I don't know, just guiding people that there are consequences to try to create some consequences and a sense of justice, right? A sense of justice from an indigenous feminist perspective about this incredible betrayal and violation 
If you're claiming to be indigenous and you're not, especially if you're white, it is a violation and it's predatory and like you need to stop doing it. And that, yeah, there need to be real consequences for that shit. It's foul. (laughs) And we should just be allowed to say that without being accused of, I don't know, any number of things. I saw so many accusations flying around on social media and I'm just done. Like, just knock it off. It's, it's, it should just be unacceptable. Yeah. 